Walters will be open at 9 a.m. on Thursday, July 4th, ahead of the 11 a.m. holiday game. Make sure to swing by Walters before seeing James Wood and the Nats. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Next pitch, breaking ball, hit in the air to deep left center field. Wood and Young going back. They won't get to it. It is gone. Goodbye. Into the Mets bullpen. Lindor gets it up into the jet stream. His 15th home run, his second in as many nights. RBIs 42 and 43. And the Mets have homered in three consecutive innings. And it's now New York 5 and Washington nothing. One ball, no strikes. Next delivery. Swinging a long drive right field. Way back it goes. It is long, long gone. Into the second deck over the bullpen. Huge hit for Luis Garcia. Has the Nationals back within a run. It's 5-4. to four. Number eight on the season for Garcia. A three-run clout. Thomas at second, the pitch. Swinging a ground ball, base hit center field. Thomas rounding third. He's going to score. James Wood delivers. National six, Mets five. James Wood's first major league RBI is a go-ahead. RBI single to center field. Off the lefty. He's only 21, folks. The maturity much older than that. And welcome to Nat Chat for Thursday, July 4th. 2024, what is Independence Day 2024? A happy July 4th to everyone listening. This is one of the great days of the year, especially from a Nationals perspective with the team having its annual 11.05 a.m. July 4th home game. I'm Al Galdi, host of the Al Galdi podcast. Mark Zuckerman is off for this installment of the podcast, but I am joined by the mastermind of the podcast, Tim Shovers, and we have a Nats win to discuss. You know, Wednesday night was post-game Freedom Fireworks night at Nationals Park, and we, during the game, got uh, big-time offensive fireworks from the Nats, a 7-5 win over the New York Mets at Nationals Park in Game 3 of a four-game series. This was a game in which the Nats overcame a 5 nothing fifth-inning deficit via scoring seven runs from the fifth through eighth innings. The Nats snapped their three-game losing streak, one for just the second time in nine games. The Nats for this regular season now are 40 and 46. This installment of the Nats Chat Podcast brought to us by Mason Kalfas and his team of 10 legal recruiters at Zenith Legal in Washington, D.C. Check out Mason's website today, zenithlegal.com, or call or text Mason anytime, 202 486 3535. Coming up later in the show, a special shout out. If you would like to deliver a shout out to someone uh, via this podcast, email Tim at Nats Chat Podcast at gmail.com. We have had a uh, lot of fun with the shout outs so far this season. But Tim, my friend, a Nats win on Wednesday evening. Wednesday night turned out to be a very good night at Nationals Park. Very good night indeed. The Nats just felt like they needed a win. Hunter Harvey stepped up in a big spot. James Wood stepped up, Luis Garcia, big evening, a comeback win. There was a lot there to like in this one, Al. There was. It's a funny deal. The Nats in this game on Wednesday evening got by far the worst of the team's three outings from starting pitchers in this series, and yet this is the Nats' first win in this series. So go figure. But the Nats' offense 
was quite good in this game. The Nats in the game, seven runs, nine hits, three walks, three for eight with runners in scoring position. And finally, the Nats homered. You know, the Mets began this game by jumping out to a 5 nothing fifth inning lead. Three home runs hit by the Mets off the Nats starting pitcher, Mitchell Parker. At that point in time, the Nats in this series had been out homered 7 nothing. It just like <laughs> slapped you right across the face. The glaring lack of power for the Nats and them getting out homered like that really drives you crazy. I know it drives me crazy. It's, it's my number one issue with this team. We're not surprised by the issue. It's been an issue for multiple seasons, but this team just does not hit home runs. Well, Luis Garcia Jr. said, not so fast, my friend. Two home runs for Luis Garcia Jr. in this game. We've talked about Garcia up and down player. At times, he looks like a real piece for the future. At times, you're like, I don't know, is this guy really going to be a true player for this team when it becomes good again? But Garcia has talent. There's no doubt about that. He has become a more consistent defender at second base. And while the offense does fluctuate, the offense, when it's good, can be quite good. And Garcia, in this game on Wednesday evening, was very good. He is the Nats starting second baseman and number six batter. Went two for three with two home runs and a walk. Garcia in the Nats one run fifth, drew a leadoff walk. Garcia in the Nats three run six, had a two out three run homer to the second deck in right field to cut the Nats deficit to 5-4. And Garcia in the Nats one run eighth, a one out solo homer to center field for a 7-5 Nats lead despite having been down to the count at one point, one two. That homer went a projected 400 23 feet per stat cast. Two impressive homers by Garcia. One hits the second deck and right. The other one goes 423. But man, really good game for him. Really good game for Luis Garcia. Clutch game. You know, you look at his stats and and you said that, you know, we waffle back and forth where he fits in. I think at this point, this is just who Luis Garcia is. But he does have a propensity for pop here and there. Nine homers on the season in the first half. That's Puts them in between 15 to 20 homers, which for a second baseman, it's not an elite second baseman. It's pretty good. It's not saying much to say that you rank highly on the Nats in home runs, but Luis Garcia Jr. is tied with Jesse Winker for number two on the Nats in home runs for this regular season at nine. C.J. Abrams is number one with 13. Garcia and Winker tied for second at nine. Lane Thomas is fourth with eight. Again, you know, you're not talking about the 27 Yankees and who's leading the team in homers, but Garcia does have some pop. His slugging percentage now is at 412, which is actually a decent bit higher than where it had been. So very good to see him do as he did on Wednesday evening. Very good to see James Wood do as he did on Wednesday evening. We have seen some good stuff from James Wood over his first three major league regular season games. So first off, you start with this. James Wood, in just his third Major League regular season game, was the Nats' number three batter. I love seeing this. We know that Davey Martinez and other managers, too, play things conservatively with highly touted prospects in terms of where those guys are batted in lineups. Wood was the Nats' number six batter for each of the first two games in this series. He gets vaulted up to the number three spot for this game three of the series. I like that. Bravo, Davey Martinez. And uh, the promotion of Wood in the lineup paid off. James Wood on Wednesday evening, two for three with an RBI single, another single, and a walk. And he had a stolen base. So Wood in the bottom of the first, a two-out, seven-pitch walk. Wood in the Nats, three runs, six, a one-out single up the middle. The single per stat cast had an exit velocity of 109.6 miles per hour. Wood in the Nats, two runs, seventh, a two-out RBI single up the middle on a one-two pitch for a 6-5 Nats lead, and he had a steal of second base. And I mentioned the exit velocity on the single in the six. James Wood in the bottom of the fourth, a one-out ground out that per stat cast had an exit velocity of 108.7 miles per hour. James Wood in this game on Wednesday evening had two of the three highest exit velocities in the game. This off Wood in the loss on Tuesday evening, having the top two exit velocities in the game. So he's hitting balls hard. He's drawing walks and he's being productive. I know the power hasn't necessarily come yet, but when you're hitting balls as hard as James Wood is hitting them, the power production is going to come. I like what we're seeing from James Wood. I really like what we're seeing from James Wood. I love that he hit third tonight. He should be number three hitter. There's no one else that I would put in over him. Uh, He got a few games to get his feet wet. That's over. 
And uh, this was a game against a team that's right neck and neck with them in the standings. And I like that Davey put him there. Another moment that I just absolutely love, Mark talked about the other evening how good of a base runner he is. Well, we saw that on display just after he came through with the go-ahead RBI hit. He then stole second, watched him run the bases earlier tonight. He looks very natural out there. Now I'm watching off television, and that's something that I look forward to seeing when I eventually am able to go to the ballpark my next game to watch him run in person because I have vivid memories of how fast Trey Turner ran the bases, and I want to get a visual comparison with James Wood. But so far, man, Al, we heard that he's a five-tool player, and it's just three games, but I've seen flashes of pretty much all of it so far, save for the glove, but we'll get there. He doesn't look overwhelmed. He looks like he fits in, and it's been a pleasure to watch him. And uh, you hope that this is the start of a beautiful thing, James Wood, at the major league level. Hey, are you a law firm partner stuck on an underperforming team while the rest of the competitors are spending big and winning big? Well, you don't have to stay on your 60-win team. Nat Chat sponsor Mason Kalfis and his team specialize in placing partners and associates at medium-sized and large law firms in Washington, D.C. and across the country. Staying at a firm too long is often a recipe for being underpaid. Explore your options today with Mason Kalfis. Call Mason today at 202-486-3535. That number again, 202 202- 486-3535. Tim Shover is here to tell you about game time. Later this summer, acts at Meriwether Post Pavilion include Hootie and the Blowfish and Rockville's own OAR. If you need tickets for the right price, check out the Game Time app. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code NATSCHAT for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code NATSCHAT for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Here's your Dylan Cruz and Brady House report for the games played on Wednesday. Cruz hit leadoff, played center field 0 for 4 in Triple A with a strikeout. Down to Double A, Brady House hit third, played third 0 for 3. His OPS is at 7.30. Now back to the show. Two balls, two strikes. The pitch to Thomas. Swing a line drive, deep left field. Nimmo going back, it's over his head and off the base of the wall. Abrams heading for third. He's being waved in. The relay throw by Lindor. The slide, he scores. This game is tied. Lane Thomas delivers an RBI double. The Nationals have come all the way back. The Nationals five, the Mets five. Big hit for Lane Thomas, the double off the base of the wall in left field. Three Nats in this game each had two hits. We talked about two of those Nats so far in Luis Garcia Jr. and James Wood. The other Nat who had two hits in this game was Jesse Winker, who actually started a game in this series for the first time. Winker did not start either of the first two games in this series. He did start this game three of the series on Wednesday evening. He was the Nats starting designated hitter and number four batter. He went two for four with a double and a single. Now, he did strike out twice, but... 
the specifics of the two hits by Jesse Winker are key. There were some really good plate appearances by the Nats in this game. Jesse Winker had a couple of them. So Winker in the bottom of the fourth, a two-out full count double to right field, despite having been down to the count at 1.02. And Winker in the Nats, three-run six, a one-out single to right field, despite having been down in that count at 1.02. So down 0-2 in each of these two plate appearances, and yet each one results in a hit by Jesse Winker. Really good job. This was a good game for the Nats offense, and this is the kind of game that we just would like to see more of. I mean, this team is capable offensively. It's not a good offensive team, that's for sure, but we do see with this team these games in which the offense is good. No one's asking for four home runs per game. No one's asking for 12 runs per game, but you know, scoring seven runs like this, erupting for seven runs over the final four innings in which you hit fifth through eighth innings, hitting a couple of homers, having two doubles, Lane Thomas had a double in this game. That's all anybody wants. You know, I don't think these are unreasonable requests. Just display some pop, put up some crooked numbers, and this team could end up being a lot better because the pitching, I know it wasn't great in terms of the starting pitching on Wednesday evening, but the pitching for the most part continues to be there. It's just a matter of the offense being decent. And on Wednesday evening, the offense was better than decent. To your point, Al, that's what makes the James Wood not getting called up to July so frustrating. And I know that he got hurt in in AAA in May and, and no one could really control that. But it's a real shame he didn't get called up earlier because it sure looked like the top four of the lineup tonight looked like a bona fide real top four. Maybe not as good as the Yankees or the Dodgers top four of the lineup. But Abrams, Lane Thomas, James Wood, and Jesse Winker, if you're a middle-of-the-pack team, that's really nothing to apologize for. I will also say with Jesse Winker in the cleanup spot, going to be a very interesting month for Jesse Winker here where we're going to see him where he is every day in the lineup and how the Nats do. And he will be mentioned as someone potentially on the trade market for a team out there that's looking to add a veteran bat at the deadline. No doubt. And I think he's a very viable trade chip. He's had a good season. He's gotten on base at a very high clip. He can play left field and he's on an expiring contract. There is no compelling argument for the Nats as a rebuilding team not to trade Jesse Winker. There will be conversations about whether the Nats will slash should trade, say, Kyle Finnegan or Lane Thomas. I happen to think that the Nats should be very open to trading those guys. I still think that the rebuild takes precedence over chasing the uh, sugar high of getting the third wild card spot in the National League. But with Jesse Winker, I think this is cut and dry. He's a veteran. He's not a piece for the future. He's on an expiring contract. He's having a surprisingly productive season. Don't overthink it. Parlay him into getting a prospect or prospects. And who knows what will become of uh, said prospect or prospects. See DJ Hers, who the Nats got for Jamer Candelario last season. You mentioned calling guys up. Uh, we did have an interesting roster development with the Nats on Wednesday. The Nats on Wednesday afternoon announced having recalled a catcher slash first baseman Riley Adams from AAA Rochester and having option catcher Drew Millis to Rochester. Wednesday was July 3rd. It was on June 2nd that the Nats announced having optioned Adams to Rochester and having recalled Millis from Rochester. Uh, Riley Adams began this season with the Nats at the major league level, got off to a good start, then cooled down big time. Millis was doing well at Rochester, and so the Nats switched those two, demoted Adams to Rochester, promoted Millis to the majors for Millis to be the Nats' number two catcher. Well, Drew Millis did not play a ton in this stint at the major league level. When he did play, he wasn't particularly good. And Riley Adams, during his time at Rochester over the last month, caught fire. Adams, during this stint at Rochester, June 2nd to July 3rd, OPS of 946 over 96 plate appearances. And he did play some first base, didn't play a ton, but as was said when Adams was demoted to Rochester with the idea finally being, yeah, we're going to give him some ABs at first base, Adams did play some first base at Rochester. So I'm interested to see if he does play any first base for the Nats at the major league level in this latest stint at the major league level. But the other obvious thing to ask is, are we going to see more of Riley Adams at catcher? 
And if we do, is he going to hit? Because Adams has been an up and down batter at the major league level. But Cabo Ruiz continues to struggle. Cabo Ruiz, in a lot of ways, is the biggest negative with this Nats season. You talk about the potential building blocks. He is having a very bad season, and he's having the kind of season that does make you rethink whether he is a true building block. Kaybird in this win on Wednesday evening as an ad-starting catcher at number five batter, 0 for 4. The numbers just continue to be very disturbing. Ruiz for this regular season now, OPS of 542. So good to see Riley Adams back. It was remarkable how well he did at Rochester this last month. And We'll see, is Riley Adams a 4A player, or is Riley Adams someone whose bat warrants him being in the lineup more than he has been? This roster move captures the unavoidable truth for the Nationals, and that's that the situation at catcher is a mess because they signed Kaver Ruiz to be a franchise catcher, and right now it does not look like this is going to pan out like they hoped for. And so Adams gets sent down. You did a great job of, uh, you know, summarizing what happened last month and then today. So Adams gets sent down to triple a to work on being a first baseman. And then a month later after crushing, it's called back up just to go back to where he was before And Millis can't get in the lineup really other than here and there while Ruiz is struggling. Like they just seem all over the map and don't know what to do. And I understand why because of the contract and lack of Ruiz production, but I don't know, Al to me, there is a lot of warning signs here. What's going on behind the plate. K. Bert Ruiz is having a second consecutive disturbingly bad season. Now, last season, he wasn't nearly this bad offensively, but he was really bad defensively. He, this season, again, has been really bad defensively, and now the offense has gotten to a new level of bad. It's disturbing. I mean, the contract certainly is a part of all of this. And it's quite clear the Nats very much want K. Bert Ruiz to be their long term catcher, right? I mean, he was a centerpiece of the big trade that ignited the rebuild, trading Max Scherzer and Trey Turner to the Dodgers in July 2021. But you got to earn it, man. Like, you can't just be handed that spot. And his play has not warranted him being the long term catcher. So we'll see. I do think that it's worth it to continue to put him out there and to see if he can somehow work his way through this. But as time goes on, you do say to yourself, like, maybe this is just who he is. And to the contract, I do think it's important to remember, eight years, $50 million. It's a significant contract. It's not an overwhelming contract. If you have to eat that contract, it's not the end of the world. It's not what the learners like to do. We know that. But if it turns out that he's not your long-term catcher, Eight years, 50 million. You know, this is not the Strasburg deal. This is not even the Corbin deal. Like, this is different. Eight for 50, you can swallow if you have to. We're not there yet, but I mean, I think that is on the table with the season that he's having. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see how much Riley Adams plays, where he plays, and when he does play, how does he play? Well, the Nats starting pitcher in this uh, 7-5 win over the Mets at Nationals Park on Wednesday evening was Mitchell Parker. And one of the things about Parker that I said after his last outing was, you know, it's so impressive. Mitchell Parker, he's a rookie. He's a guy who wasn't supposed to be the Nats major league rotation this season. But Mitchell Parker has yet to have like a true blow up start. Well, I don't know if you qualify what happened on Wednesday evening as a blow up start, but it certainly was not a good start for Mitchell Parker. He had been so good, so consistent. He did have an off night on Wednesday night. Five runs in six innings. He gave up five hits, all of which were extra base hits. Uh, He gave up three home runs and two doubles of Parker over his first 14 major league regular season starts and give it up just eight home runs. He gave up three homers on Wednesday evening, but it was a funny deal. The peripherals actually were not that bad. Parker had five strikeouts versus no walks, and he did throw a lot of strikes, 84 pitches, 61 strikes versus 23 balls. That's an excellent strikes to balls ratio. So within him giving up five runs in six innings, there were some good things. But the uh, three home runs allowed by Mitchell Parker certainly were the biggest issue. Not a good start for him. The most runs he's allowed since he's been called up. We're approaching three months of him in the big leagues. But I will say the one positive, because obviously there weren't too many of them from his appearance, and that is that he made it through six innings. Obviously didn't have it tonight, and Mets had already put up a five spot on him, but he came out and pitched a scoreless sixth inning. And I note that because the Nats are in the middle of this stretch with no off days until the All-Star break. So him pitching that extra inning, just a nice move by a young guy 
that just a few weeks ago, we didn't know if he could really pitch six innings here and there. And he goes there on an off evening, a nice feather in his cap. It is. And you know what? If he has one truly bad start every 15 starts, (laughs) I think we could all live with that. Uh, Mitchell Parker overall has done a good job. Hey, it's Al Galdi to tell you about the latest offer from Window Nation for listeners of the Nat Chat podcast. Get two free windows for every two windows that you buy, plus pay nothing with no interest for two full years. This is better than any offer that you'll hear about regarding the trade deadline. I promise you, call 866-90NATION or visit windownation.com and tell Window Nation that you want the deal that you heard about from Al Galdi on the Nats Chat podcast. Window Nation is outstanding. Every Window Nation window undergoes a 20-point inspection. Window Nation has a 96% customer satisfaction rating, and 96% of Window Nation windows installed require no follow-up service. Take advantage of this special offer for listeners of the Nats Chat Podcast. Two free windows for every two windows that you buy, plus pay nothing with no interest for two full years, call 866-90-NATION or visit windownation.com. That's 866-90-NATION or windownation.com. And make sure that you tell Window Nation that Al Galdi sent you. The best way to learn a language? Immersion. Living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards this year, you could still learn a language the second best way. And that's with Babbel. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Here's a special deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners for a limited time at babbel.com slash natschat. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash natschat. That's spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash natschat. Rules and restrictions may apply. Prize Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Unlike other apps, on Prize Picks, it's just you against the numbers. All you do is pick more or less on 2 to 6 player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as 4 correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1000. With the finals over, the hoops action doesn't stop on Prize Picks. Women's basketball is still heating up. With stars like Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese looking to make names for themselves, alongside greats like Brianna Stewart and Asia Wilson, you could win up to 100 times your cash watching them ball out. I know I'm looking at Clark and Stewart to put up more than their points projections, and I like Reese and Wilson to do the same to their points and rebounds combined projections too. Download the Prize Picks app today and use code BLUEWIRE for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code BLUEWIRE on Prize Picks for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Two balls, two strikes, two out. Tie run at second. Top of the eighth, 6-5, Nats the pitch. It is in there, strike three called. Caught him looking at a 99-mile-an-hour fastball. Knee high to the outside corner. And the inning is over. A huge pitch for Hunter Harvey. J.D. Martinez thought it was outside. That Nats bullpen, which had been quite bad over the first two games of this series, ended up being quite good in this come-from-behind win on Wednesday evening. Four Nats relievers combined for three scoreless and hitless innings. Jacob Barnes tossed a perfect top of the seventh. Robert Garcia in the top of the eighth faced three batters and got two outs. Hunter Harvey pitching for a third consecutive game in this series came through with a mammoth out in this game. I give him credit because he could not have been in a good spot coming into this game in terms of the headspace, in terms of the confidence. Davey Martinez went to him and Harvey delivered top of the eighth, faced one batter, got one out, a big out, a called strikeout of the Mets number three batter, J.D. Martinez with a runner on second, two outs, and the Nats holding a 6-5 lead. And then Kyle Finnegan, who has been sensational so far in this series, pitching for a third consecutive game in this series, a perfect top of the ninth for the save. Understand Kyle Finnegan in the game one 10 inning loss, a perfect top of the ninth to preserve a 3 all tie. Kyle Finnegan in the Game 2 10-inning loss, a perfect top of the ninth to preserve a two-all tie. And then Finnegan on Wednesday evening, a perfect top of the ninth 
for the save. We talk about deserving all-stars for the Nats. I think Jake Irvin is a deserving all-star. I think that C.J. Abrams is a deserving all-star. How do you say that Kyle Finnegan is not a deserving all-star? Kyle Finnegan, statistically speaking, has been one of the best ace relievers in the majors this regular season. 23 of 26 on saves, ERA of 198, a whip of 0.94. What a job this guy is doing this season. And props to the likes of Harvey and Garcia for doing what they did in this game, bouncing back off some recent rough outings. Yes. Let me address Garcia and Harvey first. Hats off to them for stepping up, getting through the eighth inning, especially Harvey. Way to lock that one down. To Finnegan and the All-Star, while I'm here co-hosting with you, I think this is my last chance before the All-Star rosters come out. If I had to guess who will be the Nats All-Star if they only get one, my money's on Kyle Finnegan to get that. I think he makes a lot of sense, if you're the Arizona manager, of putting him on the roster Not only is he deserving, statistically speaking, but he would actually fit well on the team and you could use him in the late innings out of the bullpen in the All-Star game. So Jake Irvin is deserving of it. He's definitely in the mix, but right now my leader in the clubhouse is Kyle Finnegan. I think in terms of most likely, I think it's Finnegan or Abrams. I think all three guys, though, are deserving. I don't think all three are going to get it, to your point. It's not often that a sub-500 team gets three All-Stars, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I think we have to be realistic about that. But it is nice to be able to talk about the Nats having three deserving All-Stars. We have not been able to say that in quite some time. We can't say that right now. I mean, there's no real, like, pushing back on this. C.J. Abrams is having an all-star caliber season. You look at his slugging percentage, you look at his war, you look at his defensive numbers. Jake Irvin is having an all-star caliber season. And Kyle Finnegan, like I said, statistically speaking, one of the best ace relievers in the majors so far this season. So good to see the Nats get this win. And man, this was an impressive come from behind win again, down five, nothing in the fifth inning. You're watching this game in real time. You had to be saying to yourself, oh boy, here we go again. Back to back 10 inning losses to begin this series against the Mets down five, nothing in the fifth inning in game three of the series. But the Nats came back. The boys battled in this game, seven runs from the fifth through eighth innings. Uh, So we have game four of this four game series Thursday morning. At 11.05 a.m., Jake Irvin will be the Nats' starting pitcher. By the way, the attendance uh, for this game on Wednesday evening, quite good, 32,391. I mentioned this being Freedom Fireworks Night for the Nats, the night before July 4th. I think pretty clearly the fireworks are a draw. Now, it's worth noting, so we talked about game one of this series. I thought the attendance was disappointing, 26,719 for the Major League regular season debut of James Wood. We talked about this both on and off the year. Hey, it's a Monday that usually in a work week is the lowest attended game of the week. The attendance should be going up. That did not happen for Tuesday evening. The attendance for game two of this series was really bad, 19,000. 844. The Nats for this regular season coming into the series had been averaging right around 25,000 fans per home game. But the attendance for Wednesday evening, really good, 32,391. So this is a small sample size in terms of like analyzing the Nats attendance for this season. The Nats overall attendance during this rebuild actually hasn't been that bad. The attendance never really has cratered in a way that you might think it would have with how bad the Nats have been in recent seasons. But it is kind of funny. (laughs) You get a fireworks game, and that's the draw. That's the game that gets the attendance up over 30,000 in this series. Not James Wood debuting fireworks. I know it's kind of counter to how we think of the team and think of baseball, but I think what's the biggest indicator of attendance at Nationals Park is is just the calendar, what day of the week it is, and if it's a holiday, and if it's a fireworks night. Like, I just don't think that, you know, oh, it's James Woods debuting. I don't think a ton of people are going to crush down on Monday. Like, it's just, it's not a Monday town for baseball. And, you know, but yet throughout this rebuild, you talk about solid attendance. Basically, every single Saturday throughout this has been a solid number, you know. like Regardless of where they are in the standings, people like to go to the ballpark on Saturdays. And I just think sort of, The calendar leads the way here. Yeah, and I think, too, when it comes to attendance, 
There's always a lag time between a team going from bad to good in the attendance becoming truly good again, right? Like, it's not like as soon as the improvement starts, the attendance ticks up. There's always a lag time because people want to see if the improvement is real. It takes some time for people to recognize the improvement. And in order for attendance to truly become good again, you need casual fans to take to the team again. Like, hardcore fans, people who listen to this podcast, they are aware of things getting better for the Nats. They are aware of someone like a Jake Irvin having a big time step forward season. I don't know how many casual Nats fans, occasional Nats viewers and attendees of games are truly aware that like Jake Irvin is having a step forward season. So I I think, you know, it takes some time. So like, I think a year from now, two years from now, that's going to be telling like where the attendance is at. And I fully expect it to be very good again. The Nats have drawn well since they came to the Washington DC area. The Nats have drawn well since they became good beginning with that 2012 season. And there's no reason to think that the Nats won't be back to truly uh, generating uh, very good attendance numbers once the team is good again. But we're in kind of that middle ground territory now of of going from bad to decent to hopefully good again. And so the attendance, I think, takes some time to catch up to that. Well, like I said, we are delivering shout outs on the Nats Chat podcast this season. You can email Tim if you want to deliver a shout out to someone who you care about, natschatpodcast at gmail.com. And uh, we have this shout out to deliver to Steve Smith. A happy birthday to Steve Smith from John, Steve's best pal since the fifth grade John fondly remembers spring training together with Steve and the recent ring game. Uh, Steve has one of the best birthdays as a Nats fan, with the birthday being on July 4th. That is a pretty cool deal. So happy birthday, Steve, and thank you uh, for that uh, shout-out request, John. The recent replica ring game right there they got to take in together when uh, the Nats played Houston and walked him off on Saturday earlier this season. Steve, one thing I think that's really cool is that pretty much – only Nats fans who have July 4th birthdays can really set to watch and know every year when the Nats are going to play on their birthday. Everyone else, it depends on the day of the week and an off day and holiday, et cetera, all of that. So that is a fun quirk if you're a Nats fan with that specific birthday. Well, also having a July 4th birthday in the world of baseball is George Steinbrenner. <laughs> so Steve, you and Big Stein. You can celebrate your birthdays together, although Big Stein, of course, no longer with us, but uh, he can be with us in spirit. I don't think that there are many things better in terms of things that the Nats do than the July 4th, 11.05 a.m. home game. This has become a tradition. I think it's a really cool thing. It's a really unique thing. I'm not aware of anyone who doesn't like this as a thing. It obviously works out so well in that you can watch the game, go to the game, do a podcast about the game, and and still have a rest of a July 4th day to enjoy with your friends and family. It's awesome that the Nats do this, and uh, I I think they deserve a lot of props for doing this. I'm actually kind of surprised more teams don't do this. Co-sign with you. I love it. It's perfect. DC has its version of Patriots Day like Boston and Fenway have had for decades. I think it's something that kind of happened right away. And I think everyone realized like, wait, this, this feels right. This is good. I love this tradition that the Nats in DC have built. And just a reminder that it is crazy that for 30 plus years, the nation's capital had no baseball on independence day. Yeah, it is nuts, but uh, it is nice to have this. What is uh, season number 20 of the Nationals being in D.C. and uh, looking forward to what should be a fun day on Thursday. You tell us what you think. Hit us up on X at Nats underscore chat. You can email the show Nats chat podcast at gmail.com. We have a website you can check out to Nats chat podcast dot com in which you can purchase a Nats chat podcast T-shirt. This installment of the Nats Chat Podcast brought to us by Mason Kalfas and his team of 10 legal recruiters at Zenith Legal in Washington, D.C. Check out Mason's website today, zenithlegal.com, or call or text Mason anytime, 202-486-3535. All Nationals radio highlights on Nats Chat are courtesy of 106.7 The Fan. For Tim Shovers, I'm Al Galdi. We thank you for listening, and we will talk to you next time on the Nats Chat Podcast. Now the set and the 1-1. One, one. There goes Wood. The pitch, a strike. The throw down by Terenz. The tag by Lindor is too late. James Wood with a feet first slide stays on the base. His first major league stolen base.